Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 60th episode of The Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie, joined as always with my best friend and other co-host, Michael Hamilton. Michael, I didn't think of a good question to ask you uh, ahead of this. I'm kind of on the spot, off the cuff riffing. What's a question that I've never asked you, but you've always wanted me to ask you? Uh, what is the question? Yeah. Has it ever been like, ooh, I hope Roger asked me about this this week. I hope Roger asked me about my super special project that I've been working on. Or I hope Roger asks me about my feelings towards this subject because I have a lot to say on it. I feel like I might have at the start, but like any any hope I had for you to ask me about anything serious was like very quickly dashed. Like when I think one of the episodes you asked me, how much wood does a wood (laughs) Chuck a woodchuck could chuck wood. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, I'm never gonna get a real question. So I just kinda had like no. I asked you what the that. meaning of life was one time. Yep. You did. Yeah. That's a real question. Life's finding meaning <laughs> sure. it's they're, important. I, they're all I guess they're all real questions, but you know, they're all <laughs> they all uh <laughs> You ask great questions, okay? Let's just leave it at that. They're great questions. They're great real questions. I'm glad my questions aren't uh, in question, so. (laughs) What are we talking about today, buddy? We made tier lists of the new meta. We're going to talk about who we think the best heroes are and who we think who are the heroes who um, are not the best heroes uh, in the game. Normally this is where I say spoiler love ya, but she's not unplayable anymore. Also, I guess more spoilers, Ooh. but where does she fall on our tier list? Watch to find out or listen to find out if that's what you're doing. Either way, let's get started. Mm-hmm. Who do you got at S tier? All right. We're starting at the top. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. All right. Uh, I have two heroes in my S tier. The first one I imagine is at the top of yours, but uh, it's Lexi. She lost... <sighs> bullseye bracers which was uh it was a small loss it is she is worse now but she was the best deck she lost bullseye bracers oh no she's slightly worse but still i think she's the best deck by a reasonable amount okay maybe not a reasonable there. amount at least a small amount uh and then next is dromai dromai has a solid lexi matchup um there was a lot going on where Dromai's deck building was kind of like, you have to build your deck in a way that can beat both Oldheim and Lexi. And that could be kind of challenging. Like you saw Mara's deck that she took to the finals. Um, she did not have a great, she should not have a great matchup in Oldheim, but she was able to take down two Lexis in, in her top eight path. So I think with Oldheim gone, you can really build your Dromai deck more focused on Lexi and the other aggro decks. And yeah, uh, I think, the, the heroes that play a lot of sixes are probably going to be tough, but I think they're going to be less represented than Oldheim was. And you're still not just dead to them necessarily. You're just like not amazing into them. So I think Dromai is second best hero right now. I think if you're playing either Lexi, Lexi or Dromai, you're making a good choice going into tournaments. That's fair. I definitely, I have one hero at S tier and I think Lexi stands alone up there. Um, and, but, you know, it's also in common with your two heroes as they both had not a particularly good old high matchup and he's gone. And now that they're particularly not good matchup is just gone. They just get to go right to the top. Um, especially Lexi. I feel like what was most difficult about Lexi, maybe not was even her like actual gameplay into old time, because that was still kind of really skill intensive, but kind of the deck building restrictions that have been lifted from her where she kind of had to build and play in very particular ways in order to overcome old times defenses and now that she doesn't have to worry about those kinds of play patterns or deck building considerations she's just kind of free to build her deck in new and um, more disruptive ways to kind of handle all this wave of like aggressive decks that have been freed by old times um living legend status as well and I think everybody's kind of on the same page that she's going to pivot to kind of maybe it's just more of a disruptive ice package. How deep you go on that? I'm not a hundred percent sure. I don't know if she'll start running things like channel, like frigids and like stuff like that again, or if it'll still just be like a light splash for things like um, Arctic incarcerations and winter's bites and things like that. I don't know how deep she go on it, but it's definitely a tool that's in her toolkit. And that's to speak nothing of like 
um, her other available deck building options, like maybe Lightning Lexi can make a comeback now with the new Lightning card that was printed in Dust Till Dawn. Uh, seems underexplored. Maybe there's something there. Uh, but, you know, before she, there was like, she just had this whole gap of cards in for that deck and getting just even three new copies of a card might be what it needs to just kind of take it off to the uh, next year. So I think for all those reasons, I think she's just going to be the de facto best hero um, in the game. And what I hope happens, though, is if you're ready to move on to A tier, uh, I can list off my first hero. Because I put mine in like order of who I think, they, how strong they are in each tier. Uh, but mm-hmm. I'm ready to move on to A tier if you are. All right, I'm, I'm good. Let's go. First hero in A tier, uh, Bravo, Showstopper. Okay. I know, because what I'm hoping for is that Bravo is going to just be able to step right into those big old guardian shoes that old him lift off. They are big shoes, and they are shoes with one crown of seeds sized hole left in them as well. But um, I think, weirdly, uh, Starstruck from Dust Till Dawn might be just kind of this tech card that kind of fills in a lot of the other issues that he had where he just didn't have a critical mass of like good disruptive uh, attacks. Like obviously everybody knows crippling crush, very disruptive, very powerful, semi cost, very hard to block 11 power. But outside from that, you know, the heroes that wanted to tech for him, it was kind of just like throw some two block armor, like perch grapplers and a sink below maybe. And you're going to be able to cover up things like uh, spinal crush at nine and uh, choke slam at eight pretty easily. It's not super hard to do. Uh, that's not the case with Starstruck, though. It, it goes all the way up to 10 power, and um, its effect is also, I would say, more disruptive uh, than either choke slam and maybe along the same lines as Spinal Crush as well. So, if nothing else, just getting three more copies of like a Spinal Crush level effect already is something that like he's incredibly happy for. But I think as a yellow, it's a fine resource card for him, given like how his kind of resource curves break out a lot of the time. And then he also has the tool on it with the Unity ability to block with it and a card from his hand in order to kind of smooth out uh, something else. So maybe he does come in with a choke slam, just to, or he blocks with two cards for six, and then he's enabled to play like one of his four cost attacks because he has that seismic search token now. So I think that kind of gave him a lot of uh, subtle power level boost and to and he was already a solid deck like he was already floating around like somewhat he also particularly didn't have an amazing old high matchup like a lot of the other heroes and now that he doesn't have to worry about getting hard fatigued by old him he doesn't have to run like remembrances and a million copies of pulverize and because kind of because he had he he definitely had a lot of deck considerations he had to give to old time like everybody did in the format uh, and now he can kind of more similarly adapt to just kind of what the rest of the format's bringing to him instead. And I guess that's, that's and maybe this is a little bit of copium and, or hopium or something like that, but like I want him to be the next best hero after Lexi because I want Lexi to have to start building her, her deck in a way that she has to respect Guardians or these kinds of game plans again. And that would go a long way to like balancing out the meta as a whole, I feel. Yeah, that... All that reasoning makes sense. I think I I could see Bravo being that good. Um, Oldheim was very good. And I think Oldheim decks <laughs> towards the end of the format actually looked a lot closer to Bravo decks than they ever really did in the past. Like they used to be these high elemental stuff, but like at the end of the format, they were a bunch of guardian and blue three blocks, a bunch of big disruptive guardian attacks, a big bunch of defense reactions. And like, yeah, yeah well, our team Krasnos name joke really for good, him was but... Bravoheim, right? As we were testing for him on the Pro Tour, we just had the name Bravoheim floating around a lot <laughs> for the end of the format. Yeah, so it's it's definitely plausible that Bravo could be a, a very big pillar of the metagame. And if he has a solid Lexi matchup, if Lexi has to warp her deck to fight Bravo, and Bravo is also very solid into Dromai as well. So like definitely better than Oldheim was into Dromai. So with those two things... Being I think that was debatable that, before, but like... once again, Starstruck is kind of popping up to be another popper that you're happy to play because 
Oldheim had copies of Mulch and Glacial Footsteps as like these extra blue six power poppers uh, that Bravo just didn't have access to. He's playing cards like Showtime and Imposing Visage and things like that. So his blue popper count usually, or his total popper count was usually anywhere from like at least three to like six to sometimes like even eight, nine copies. And uh, it was Dromai used to be quite a difficult matchup for Bravo overall, I would say, actually, um, just because you you did lack the, the total popper count. But getting once, but bringing that popper cop count back up to like, you know, 38, 39, 40 poppers, I think goes a long way in showing that matchup again and giving her a similar style of deck building issues. And if she's not ready to combat like that heavy, crazy, go long popper deck, like if she just takes all the blinders off and says, like, I'm just going to focus on Lexi and aggro decks now. Uh, and Mara style, style build becomes way more popular. That's also insanely good for Bravo. So I don't know. We'll see. I guess the other big loss that, that Bravo had oh, is uh, you, don't, you don't get to place the lag mine anymore. I know Oldheim was on Rampart a lot of the time, but the threat of them having stalagmite was always real. And like, if they if they flip stalagmite instead of rampart, then like your whole game plan had to change. And like if you boarded to fight a hard fatigue and then they have stalagmite and they're just aggroing you down and they stalagmite you twice in the game, that's that was a pretty rough thing that happens sometimes too. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, obviously, like I said too, with the crown of seeds, when you are playing rampart, if you play rampart and bravo instead of stuff like that, then you're not gonna have access to like those more consistent resource sinks. His arsenal is more prone to getting clogged up. I'm not saying he's exactly as good as Oldheim was in the previous meta one for one, but I think that he has the potential to uh, fill a very similar role and kind of step into the format ready to... I don't think he's completely just blown out of the water um, like overall metagame wise, and I think he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. So. That being said, second hero in A tier is Dromai. I hate it. I hate it. I wish I put her all the way down in F minus unplayable tier. Uh, but a lot of things. Uh, I, I think the old high matchup was like incredibly bad for Dromai. Even uh, in, even when Dromai thought it was good, I think it was still just an incredibly skill testing format. And as we saw, like in Michael Fung in his quarterfinals semifinals uh match against the big drum eye deck like he just played a masterful two hour long game and it was just like i i don't care like you had you have like a million remembrances and you're gonna do these loops uh i'm just the better player and i can execute my deck to still beat your game plan into me um and i think that kind of cemented like her kind of nail in the coffin in terms of like overall meta presence, in my opinion. Like if your deck is supposedly good into like old time, and that's the reason why you're bringing it, but then it's not actually even good into old time. Like that's why I called her unplayable. Like what, why, what are you even doing? Because you're soft against aggro and you're okay in Alexi. But if you're still just like completely dead or have this like extremely difficult matchup in old time, like sorry, you just can't be in the format. Uh, but old time's gone. And so she gets to be in the format now, I think. And I think overall, some things have also helped her out a good amount. Um, she got a couple new tools in uh, Dust Till Dawn. I think Lost in Thought is a very powerful card and something that she's uh, in particularly uh, interested in. She hasn't really had access to a lot of majorly disruptive effects, just kind of like the big uh, majestic legendary dragons was kind of the only way she really had to be like, disruptive uh but lost in thought kind of gives her another tool another red card uh with go again that she's pretty happy to slot into her deck i think um and it acts and offers her to that disruptive element so uh yeah not unplayable anymore drove my i i think it's still a strong statement to call her unplayable when she uh top eighted worlds and had two copies in the top four of the last pro tour drove has got a pretty good uh Pretty good record for doing well in these major events. Michael, are you accusing me of hyperbole? Are you accusing me of having hot takes and hyperbole on this podcast? I am. I am. I, that is something I, am I would so offended. Of. Okay. <laughs> who, who, who do you have next today, Tier? Uh, Azalea. And this one was close between the next two heroes. 
Um, and this might be a little too high, but um, once again, I guess I'm hoping for another hero that would be a counter to Lexi and hopefully then level up the meta as a whole. Uh, Azalea might be out of any of the heroes we discussed so far had the worst old high matchup and was completely just just kept down by just no almost an unwinnable matchup uh against old time a lot of the time like you had to really tech and have a lot of things line up your way in order to win that match and um red in the ledger it's a hell of a card man and that card is ready to come out and just dominate for i guess uh the pun if we want to go with here the format a little bit so what do you think yeah, I, I think Azalea is very good. Uh, old time leaving was huge. I think she's still going to struggle into Bravo, still going to struggle into Dromai. But if you can get her Lexi matchup to be reasonably favored, then Lexi's probably going to be the most played hero at most big events going forward. So Azalea is a solid choice. And I don't think her Bravo or Dromai matchups are as bad as her old time matchup was. That matchup was like truly, truly, really difficult. And Yeah, Crown of Seeds and uh, what did a lot of work in that matchup for sure. Azalea did lose Bullseye Bracer, which I think was pretty important. It was really important getting value out of the Rain Razor's turns. Um, sometimes you would blind Azalea and rely on Bullseye Bracer. Um, it let you, it, it opened up a lot of play lines and also gave you that AB2 without really giving up a real equipment slot to kind of boost your wizard matchups as well. So I think. The bullseye ban is going to hurt Azalea, but old high believing is going to help her more than the bullseye hurts her. Yeah, I think she has to have some a uh, little bit different deck build requirements without bullseye bracers. I think toxic tips. Um, I know some people are talking about hornet sting, but if she's able to consistently push through like thirteen damage um, turns, like being able to then throw in one of the disease tokens on top of that seems like a pretty good effect, and it has it still has the blade break one in case of emergency as well so um i'm kind of thinking that's going to be the arm piece we'll see which one kind of shakes out there uh and i think you just kind of have to play build your deck in a little different way like maybe you don't play rain razors anymore and you play like uh take aim that three that zero for three with reload or something like that um you maybe put up a couple more reload effects in your deck in order to help get the cards into your arsenal a little bit easier um i don't know the tools are there and ultimately at the end of the day like i said she still has her most powerful thing and just being able to load up a big old dumb old red and ledger and say you don't get to play the video game this turn so we'll see <laughs> card game video game same thing <laughs> yeah whatever uh final hero in a tier for me is briar um briar also not a great uh old time matchup and uh just couldn't quite get there. Couldn't quite get those last two living legend points, eh? Um, but I think the new Earth three block, or not, well, three block with the Unity card that she got is kind of uh, a perfect card that she needed to just kind of round out her kit. Um, the Earth cards historically, obviously, have proven to be a little underpowered overall outside of Channel Mount Heroic. There's not a lot of Earth cards that you're like, wow, I get to play. Uh, so tomorrow we did it we're <laughs> we're doing it <laughs> you know blue autumn's touch um, used to be banned that's a good card that's i've you know that's a great point michael um <laughs> but yeah <laughs> i think she serves uh i think briar's back baby i think there's a briar back in town uh so my a tier is very different from yours <laughs> Oh, no Briar and A tier. Okay. Hit me with your A tier. No, no Briar and A tier. So uh, first, at the top of A tier, I put Levia. I think that Levia is a hero that's going to take a long time to figure out the optimal builds. The new Demi Hero flip ability is extremely, extremely powerful. And Levia has always been a little bit better than people gave her credit for. She's capable of some very strong turns. And the biggest issue that she had was she'd do her strong turn, she'd play above rate the whole game, and then one turn she'd take 10 damage from Blood Dead and lose the game. Now, that turn is going to happen less often because you have the two flip options. Um, and then you also just have more um, good cards. A lot of her card pool got upgraded in the new set. She got a few new good Majestics. Um, I'm blanking on card names right now, but they are there, I promise. <laughs> um, Slither, Slitherpede, whatever it's called. 
Um, that one's very good. Uh, the new weapon that is six power, the Hell's Hammer, is good. I don't think the Fleshbag Hat will see a lot of play, but it is an option. And then Shade and the Death biggest Hydra. thing really is. Yeah, Shade and Death Hydra, potentially good. Diabolic um, Offering. I think the biggest thing... Which one's Diabolic Offering? That's the one that becomes six and when there's a six banished. Either oh yeah, that card's, great. Six that card's great. I always you forget that card. That card for six a lot, and I'm like, hmm. I have, I have. <laughs> it's, it's. I was not expecting good. a six um, flock out of nowhere. <laughs> and then, I think these cards are all pretty big upgrades. But the biggest thing really is that new flip ability to turn into Blasmafet most often, and then in the long grindier matchups, you can turn into Levia Redeemed and gain some life, and also not have to worry about turning off Blood Dead every turn. So, yeah. I think. She might not show up this weekend. I, mean, I know I'm playing her, but I am not convinced I'll have her figured out by the battle hardened. There is a lot of potential things that could be good, but I think before we see the bannons, or I think by nationals, Levia will be a force to be reckoned with and solidly deserve her spot in A tier. Yeah. You were playtesting a lot against Lexi today. What was your record? Uh, <laughs> I lost seven in a row, but oh, you know, we're A-tier. still, we're still figuring it out. We're still figuring <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, my build is plenty of cards off what I'm registering at the Battle Hearted right now. We're still we're still working on it. Okay, we're still working. Fair on enough. Uh, next, I put Viserai. I think Viserai is the better of the Rune Blades right, or, or honest, the best of the three Rune Blades right now. He has the highest damage potential for the most part. I think outside of Force of Nature Channel, but like big Mordred Revel turns are still huge. The new non-attack action. Um, Runic Reckoning that I spoiled is actually extremely good in Viscerai, where getting a non-attack action that blocks for three is great. Um, if you're playing a two-attack turn, you can just play it for free, and the one cost on it is not ideal when you have to pay the one cost to get it, but you're still triggering your Viscerai ability, and it's just all around a very good card and exactly what um, he needed, another red, powerful three-block non-attack action. I imagine he'll be fight, but it using costs. that to flash in a uh, off of spellbound creepers a lot just because you'll play your things get your rude chant activate creepers for a resource this is free now boom yeah you have to be a little bit careful about it because it's not going to pump your rosetta thorn um so you have to have another attack usually swarming or rattle bones or something to play with it rattle bones a swarming or swarming itself um and then there's still multiple builds of this right you can do like the cash and stuff with the hat and just really like be a hero that's consistently doing 20 to 25 damage turns on your cash in turn. And that's really big. And also I think Viscerai is quite good into Dromai and just if the format becomes mid rangey where people are just like throwing the biggest numbers at each other, Viscerai is the best there. Um, his Lexi matchup's not great. I think that's the only matchup that he's really concerned about, but that's not a great one to be concerned about right now. Um, so you th- is yours in order in A tier? So you think it's like Lexi one, Levia two, Viserai three? No, sorry, sorry. A- my A tier is Levia and Viserai. Lexi and Dromai. So, but that is. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah Lexi, that, Dromai, that, Levia, Viserai. Okay. Uh, next, I have Azalea. We talked a bunch about Azalea. She's going to be good. She has a pr- probably a positive Lexi matchup and can struggle against she some destroys of the other decks, But Red in the Ledger is very good. Destroy strong. I think. She is probably favored in Eviscerai, but I don't think it's by a lot. Okay. Um, then, then we have Uzuri. I think Uzuri is carried by her Lexi matchup. She's kind of designed to fight Lexi with infinite frailty tokens, which are very good against Lexi because Lexi's trying to play two to three attacks per turn from Arsenal. So Uzuri's ability to give so many frailty tokens is very good there. Uzuri also threatens to fatigue Lexi, which is something that as a ranger, Lexi can be vulnerable to. And without Bullseye Bracer, it's going to be hard to play a three arrow turn without starting on an arsenal. And since Uzuri has so much arsenal destruction between Leave No Witnesses and Command and Conquer and Codex is to bring those back, you're not, I guess Codex gives you an arsenal, but you're not always going to be wanting to arsenal against Uzuri because you usually can't protect that arsenal. Um, Unfortunately, Uzuri is held back by bad matchups against most of the other heroes in the game. I think Oldheim was her worst matchup, and that one left, so that does help. But 
you're really gonna have to figure out how to fight these other strong heroes if you want to make Uzri work. But being favored against the best hero in the format is always a good starting point. And then last is a hero that I feel like doesn't get talked about, but keeps winning events. So I threw Dash as my last hero in A, in a tier. I don't think she got any new cards, but she won the calling on Pro Tour weekend. Um, Lexi lost one piece of equipment that can consistently block T-Bones. So it's easier to now blow up Lexi's hat with your T-bone, mag- T-Bones and Magmatic Shockwaves because there's no Bullseye Bracer to just block for zero infinitely. And Dash is a hero that had to dedicate a lot of sideboard slots to fighting Oldheim. So with those sideboard slots being now available to do other things, you don't need to have 10 slots dedicated to defense reactions to be able to be Oldheim. You can now potentially do something else with your sideboard if you want to. So Dash rounds out my A tier. Uh, if... Lexi wants to in that matchup though she can play shock charmers and those zero block infinitely just something to think about um but yeah I think that's a solid list especially as we get into b tier and the first hero in my b tier is levia so maybe we're just like one tier off from each other maybe I maybe if we if we just like shift all of mine like one half tier in one direction because I was just so adamant about where Lexi is above the rest of the format maybe you were just more uh, homogenized with your rankings but it doesn't seem like we're too too far off um but yeah because yeah. i have levy be, as my first hero on b tier i'd be surprised if any of our heroes were like more than two tiers apart from each other but it, or at least or two or more tiers apart but we'll, we'll see we'll see yeah yeah so i like levy for all the reasons you just said um especially like just some of the builds that you've been experimenting with have seemed really powerful with some of the like just the the raw value that she can kind of accrue now on a lot of her hands. Um, it's very annoying. Um, and she obviously still gets access to uh, Carrion Husk, which is also very annoying. It's just this huge just armor chest piece you have to overcome at some point in the game that just kind of buffers her and gives her kind of that wiggle room to keep coming back with those really annoying uh, high value turns. So... Um, out of all the heroes in Dust Till Dawn, I think she got the biggest improvement um, to be fair, I think she was the worst hero out of all the heroes in Dust Till Dawn. Um, I guess it's hard to evaluate because Prism was living legend and then Vincent didn't exist yet, but she was definitely worse than Bolton and now she's definitely better than Bolton, uh, at least in my opinion. And yeah, I'm excited to see what Levia does. She, she deserves some time to shine, you know? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, right after Levia I... is Uzuri. Okay. You agree? You agree with my Levia takes? Yeah, I, I was like, I, I agree that Levia is better than Bolton. That's why I put her a tier at a different tier than Bolton. That's fair. That's fair. Um, and I think maybe the other reason why I have these tiers a little bit lower um, than you as well is because, like I said, is that Lexi has that potential to pivot into ice. And Uzuri in particular was a hero that was playing like what six blue cards total in her deck before. So if Lexi pivots to an ice Lexi build, uh Uzuri's not gonna be creating too many frailty tokens when she has like four frostbites on her side of the battlefield or a channel like Frigid's out. So uh I think that's a matchup that Lexi can e- pretty easily flip to being not bad, uh just given the deck building uh space for it. So but we'll have to see. Um, but that being said, Uzri was way better than we gave her credit for when she first came out. Um, definitely, you know, through it all somehow found her foothold in the meta, uh, last season, which was, uh, really surprising to me. Uh, I just didn't think like her cards on rate or what her overall game plan was, especially without like good weapons. Like she's still playing spider bites and things like that really made a lot of sense. Um, but I guess that's what happens with assassins. You never see them coming, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually very surprising how well Uzuri did despite having like a pretty horrendous matchup against two of the three best decks. For sure, for sure. Right after Uzuri, I have Dash. So once again, not following uh too far behind you. Uh I guess Dash did have a good matchup into old time, so that's something about her. But um just that's just she won a calling, you know? 
she 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 won some callings last season and like nobody i feel like dash is just the most overlooked hero just because like she's like vanilla ice cream she's like the vanilla ice cream of flesh and blood heroes she's just like she doesn't have a lot going on she's just you know there chilling with like one set and two supplemental sets of support just doing her mechanologist thing boosting away living her best mechanologist life that she can with like her 200 total cards she has access to or whatever <laughs> and yeah just doing and most of them she can't play things. anyway because they're generics <laughs> so they don't yeah. work for boosting <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i love dash uh, and or right... i love vanilla ice cream but i hate dash <laughs> so i don't like <laughs> that analogy <laughs> Then we'll talk about the chocolate ice cream of Flesh and Blood decks. Then we'll talk about Viscerai. Uh, you know, he definitely has a lot of powerful things. And I think the one card you didn't mention was his new specialization uh, that came out. The Bequest, the Vast Beyond, kind of gives him that one-off uh, Skeletta effect for an attack action card. And um, what's nice is that it that effect double stacks, right? So you only need five rune chance before you can cast um, birthday cake, uh, the ninth blade or whatever. So uh, I don't know if a hundred percent it'll see play, uh, but we'll see. But also having access to the diadic carapace, I guess I should have talked about this with Briar too, but that card's like just subtly good for rune blades. They already had just like this massive fridge of block armor to get uh, through in the grasp and crown of providence. And now they just have more fridge to get through. Um, So allowing them to just kind of really mitigate their opponent's aggression without using any cards in their hand to swing back with their big room blade cards. Once they have their good setup turn lined up, I think is going to do a lot for those heroes to help them get a better foothold in the metagame. Yeah. The, the new chess piece, the dyadic carapace is a very good call. That's going to, be very helpful in quite a few other matchups. Right after Viscerai, I have the Wizards, Icelander and Kano. Uh, you can kind of swap them in any order. I don't, but they're just the heroes that once you're not expecting them, they're going to get you. As, long, as soon as you start to cheat on that arcane barrier a little too much, or you think, oh, I'm safe from a wizard. I don't need to care about what's going on. And boom, you get kano for 30 damage out of nowhere. Um, maybe they're a little too high, but I just think that they just have that ever presence of just like right in the middle of the pact and their game plan is just so unique that they kind of will always, it's too, it's hard for them to go too far down, you know? Yeah, I definitely put them lower, but I'll talk about it when I get to them on my tier list, but they are right next to each other. That's fair. I also thought, uh, the bullseye bracers ban helped, I guess, but Kano in particular now as well, because that's just less free arcane barrier that's floating around in the format, but we'll see. And then last hero in B tier, this might also be too high. It's a little bit of copium, but Bolton, uh, because basically what all I wanted for what I think dust all Dawn did is they took him from, I guess, what was, he was like a C tier hero. And now he's a he's like the last of like the B tier heroes. He he went like maybe up one half notch of tier list power level uh, with his overall card quality, but there's still a lot to be desired. And uh, in his game plan, I tried a lot. I tried a lot of builds. I did a lot of things with Bolton in the past few weeks. None of them were great. They were just they were just still just Bolton things overall. Fair, fair. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think Bolton, I think Bolton belongs to the B tier spoilers. He's also in my B tier. I think he did get significantly better. I think Saber's combo is still very threatening. The, it's bad against ice and codex of frailty, but V for valor does a lot for Saber's combo. And then, um, the new gloves are also surprisingly strong with Raiden in my opinion. And the bannerets are also quite nice with Raiden as well. So I think. Bolton did get quite a bit better. Um, I don't think he is good enough to be in A tier or S tier, but he, there's power there. The people that love Bolton will probably still play Bolton, and except for me, he's he's good. Do you really love Bolton if you're playing another B tier hero instead? <laughs> so I'm gonna go to my B tier. 
<laughs> Go for it, buddy. Um, so first is Briar. I think Briar is slightly worse than Viscerai. I think she is reasonably worse than Adromai. I think she's worse than the Runeblade Mirrors. And not much better into Ice Lexi. Maybe slightly, but not by a lot. So I I don't think... I don't think there's a lot of reason to play Briar over Viscerai, basically, if you're worse than Adromai and you're not reasonably better into Lexi. Um, so Briar and B tier. The new the new specialization that blocks and creates an embodiment does help her match up. I think she or help her match up against the decks that are going big. I think um decks like Azalea and Bravo are probably going to struggle a little bit into Briar if they are not dominating every turn. But fortunately the two decks that do go or unfortunately for Briar, the two decks that are trying to go big right now have pretty consistent access to dominate if they want it. Um next I have Bravo. I think he could be higher up. I kind of rated this hero really, really lowly for a long time because like there was just never a reason to play him over old time. Old time just was significantly better than Bravo at not at everything, but just he was just there wasn't Enough much things. of a reason to play Bravo <laughs> over old time. Yeah. So um B tier might be a little conservative on my Bravo rating because Starstruck's very strong and Guardians are just they have the be- very good equipment suites. I don't know if I should say the best, but their equipment suite is very, very good. And even without Stalagmite, he's still probably going to be strong. Um, next, I have Bolton. Um, I kind of talked about him a little bit when you talked about Bolton, but I think the new gloves are very good with Raiden. I think the Bannerets are good. I think V for Valor is good. And I think his Lexi matchup is going to be very, very challenging, but I That's think one Bolton looks fine against basically the rest of the good heroes. And because of that, I don't think I can put him too far down, even though I think he's going to have a really, really tough time with Lexi. And yeah, then, a hero that you haven't mentioned he... that he's bad into, though, is Uzuri, where he can really struggle into the disruption that Uzuri provides because he needs his arsenal slot because he's just so card hungry. He's usually looking to arsenal like either a Lumina or a V or the uh, Vanguard or something like that. Like one of his like payoff cards gets stuck in arsenal, you know, quite often. And Uzuri being a hero that is very good at disrupting arsenals lines up really well there as well as giving uh Bolton frailty tokens when they're on Saber's combo. Obviously we both know is not a thing that Bolton really wants to do with or deal with so between those two things i think Uzuri is an incredibly challenging matchup for bolton overall and uh yeah just want to throw that out there yeah that, that, that's kind of surprising for me to hear because i would expect raiden to be quite good into Uzuri because Uzuri like generally draws these clunky hands that have too many attack actions that she can't really use and a lot of the time one or two of these attacks she wants to block with and you really don't want to be blocking with too many attacks against raiden you're just pumping his stuff up making his attacks well, I want to say above rate, but sometimes it's just yeah. But Uzuri also rate. plays like <laughs> three sinks, three fates, right? She plays a lot of defense reactions in her package too. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's that's fair. That's fair. Sinks, fates, and frailty traps are all quite good against Poland. Especially frailty trap. Oh my god! Could you imagine trying to go for a sabers combo and your opponent plays frailty trap? Yeah, I think I think trying to sabers combo Uzuri might be pretty challenging. But... For sure. For sure. Oh. Frailty Trap responding. I guess it can't respond to the soul or banishing a card from soul to give go again because then it'll already have resolved to give it go again. Otherwise, the Frailty Trap won't make the Frailty No, token. the, 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 but so like if you're one above and you get a Frailty token, you go back down to zero, you don't get the go again. It has to, it, ha, it, it checks on resolution. Right. But Frailty Trap won't give a Frailty token unless it already has go again. So like something like uh, Prism flashing in the, the figment that gives minus one to attacks will stop Bolton's thing. So you just, but you just, you create a paradox game state where it would have go again <laughs> if you had a frailty token, but it doesn't, you have a frailty token, so it doesn't get go again, but then it doesn't have go again. So then it gets go again. And <laughs> since it has go again, it doesn't get go again. And then you just, the game ends in a paradox. So that's the other reason why I think that match is tricky. Because of paradoxes. Mm-hmm. They need it. Nobody, nobody sees them coming. Okay, so my last B tier hero is Katsu. I think that Katsu got actually lost his worst matchup. I think his worst matchup was Oldheim, and it wasn't particularly close. Um, 
whole time was the reason that I kind of gave up on Katsu. And I don't think he is one of the best decks, but I think there is room to play Katsu and do well. I think he isn't out of, he isn't like hopeless, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I think that if someone did like top eight a calling with Katsu, I wouldn't be surprised if someone won a calling with Katsu. I would be a little surprised, but that's true about all the heroes in B tier. I think um, he's just reasonably better than all the heroes in C tier. And I think more likely to do well than them. And that's why yeah. he's at the uh, bottom I, of B tier for me. Once again, we're not too far off. Katsu's the first hero in my C tier. Literally, literally first hero in my C tier is Katsu. Uh, the reason why I put him down one notch lower is because um, ultimately in playing some Katsu last season, the biggest thing that frustrated me was that you kind of have this three turn lag period at the start of the game where you need the combo cards in your graveyard for bonds of ancestry in order to do your like most powerful lines. And until you get those cards in your graveyard, you're just kind of handicapped in terms of like what your deck can like functionally do sometimes. And that's just not an issue that the other aggro decks have like if Lexi's like, oh no, I drew Rain Razors three of a kind in my second, uh, my first hand of the game. She just plays Rain Razors, does a million damage. But like you're like turn one, oh, I have the full bonds combo in my hand. Oh, this doesn't do anything. Like you just kind of have to like figure out how to use your cards in some other way or manner. And the bonds of ancestry and the other two pieces obviously don't uh, discard to his ability. So it can just lead to some pretty clunky interactions overall in those first few turns for being like a deck that I would consider to be aggressively slanted overall. Um, so I think that's that maybe there's a way to address that or fix that, or maybe there's some other unique uh, tools overlooked from outsiders to build Katsu as, but that's kind of why I put him a little lower. And I put him right along his other ninja buddy, Phi, for kind of a similar reason where Phi lost a little minimalism and I feel like his just damage output kind of fell off a cliff. They're just both kind of good at doing mediocre, slightly above rate damage turns sometimes with the right setups. Um, and then outside of that, there's not really a lot going on. There's not a lot, like Katsu has some disruption in Dishonor, but that's about it. They're not very disruptive decks. They're not particularly great at blocking a lot of the time because they have so many two blocks in their deck. You can shore that up a little bit with uh, cards like Flick Flack to help give some of those uh, combo pieces. I guess in Katsu, you can't play Flick Flack really well in Phi. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of put them hanging out, top of C tier, uh, waiting for their ninja day. Their ninja day. It'll come. Well, Phi already had his yeah. day. He got multiple cards banned so now he's he had too many play. days i guess <laughs> <laughs> poor Fi. got got his gloves yeah. banned got belittle banned and actually i'm looking at a theme for my entire tier now at c tier i said slightly above rate damage not a lot of on hits and i'm like oh yeah that's dorinthia reinar as well and i'm like oh oh that's c tier <laughs> Uh, there's one, so I guess I go Dorinthia. Everything that I said about ninjas, you can basically copy and paste for Dorinthia, except replace their ninja cards with Dawnblade interactions. And Reinar, you can copy and paste everything I said about those ninjas onto Reinar, except you get to do Scapskin, Leathers, Brute things sometimes. Uh, last hero at the bottom of C tier, though, is Vincent. Could be wrong. Maybe there's a broken Vincent build. We haven't found it. She's been getting beat up a lot. And uh, her problem is uh, she's good at being disruptive sometimes with like those like uh, widespread uh, cards, either destruction, annihilation, or things like that. Those effects that trigger on loss of life at the end of a combat chain are extremely powerful when you get to do them. It's just a question of like consistency and like modularity and game plan where she really doesn't have a lot of different avenues to go it seems like it's like she's just doing this one thing and if that one thing doesn't work out or isn't as disruptive as it needs to be in the matchup then she just kind of falls apart so yeah that's fair i i put vincent at the top of my c tier i think we haven't found it yet but i think that the rate of sometimes you get to do one card sixes is just like figuring out the rest of the shell of the deck to also be above rate and not just your one card sixing your rune gates or one card sevening your rune gate attacks with slight upside like one card seven is very good um 
but you can't like you can't play like the go again cards like you can't like scar for scar into seven or into the rune gate card or you can't swarm and gloomville into the rune gate card because those kill all your rune chance so like how do you get value out of the rest of the cards in your hand and that's a puzzle that i think i said this when she came out is how do you play three four card hands and i still haven't figured it out i think if you can't figure it out she might be good enough but right now it's it's really it's really tough so <laughs> top of c yeah and then there's that whole uh, issue could see we her. just talked about last time oh what was what's the whole issue oh where when she's blocking um at the end game since her ability is not a may oh. like she plays really poorly from behind so i don't know yeah so if you can figure out how to get Lots of points of value out of the last cards in her hand, then I think she'll be good. Right now, that seems very hard to get more than just the value you're getting out of blocking with your cards out of your extra cards a lot of the time. And that's not a great place to be. I think Runic Reckoning was a card that I was excited to try and Vincent. It. it does not turn on our hero power, which means you need another thing if you want to make your one rune chant unblockable to trigger all your rune gate card payoff things. So it being a zero for three on offense with no upside and a zero for three on defense with no upside. Um, not sure if that card's good enough. And a lot of the shadow cards kind of suck. So <laughs> she's in a rough spot, but a lot of the shadow non-attack actions kind of suck, I guess I should say. So that's fair. we'll see. I might be missing something, but top of C tier, she could easily fall to D tier or move up to B tier. I think if people, depending on if people figure out right now, I think what I have found so far, she would be in D tier, but I think there's still room for things that make her better than that. And yeah, I have my focus is on Lavia though. So I'll come back to Vincent after I break Lavia maybe, but I'll probably just keep playing Lavia until they ban something. If Lavia gets broken anyway, moving on. <laughs> uh, then I have the wizards. I think that the reason I can't put them in B tier is if Lexi wants to beat you, she plays Shock Charmer's Heart of Ice, and she can never lose to Kano. If she wants to beat Ice Laner, she plays Null Rune Gloves, beats Ice Laner every time. So it takes like one card slot, and matchups are great. Um, two card slots for Kano, one for Ice Laner. They're both horrible into Dromai, and those are the best two decks, the most popular two decks, in my opinion. I guess if Dromai is not popular, and you can, and the Lexis don't respect you at all, you can bring these heroes and do well. But with Dromai being like, Dromai doesn't even need a tech for you. It's going to be a very good matchup for her. And if Lexi de- devotes one or two slots, you're going to have a really tough time as well. So I think that if the, the Rangers and Dromai weren't around, these heroes would be some of the best heroes in the game, especially Icelander, but they are. So C tier. <laughs> Uh, then yeah, I, have that's fair. I forgot about how bad the draw my matchup is now i guess i just blocked that part of my <laughs> mind i just it's just like <laughs> you don't even have the poppers anymore in our build so it's just like you just like might as well just uh just walk away as soon as they caught cast a, a rake the embers your opponent cast one rake the embers just just get up from the table you, you did it i can't win goodbye rake the embers is a good card <laughs> so then i have reinar I think if there are decks that want to block a lot that are doing well or try to do some kind of disruption, like I think Reinar's okay into, or I think Reinar's solid into Dromai and okay into Azalea and Usury. And, you know, not great in anyone else. Definitely not good into Lexi. Definitely not good into Viscerai. <laughs> and I think he is going to play reasonably, or he's going to, he's reasonably less efficient than Levia and. That's enough that I don't think he will see much play or many results. He is not in D tier because somehow Reinars keep doing okay with him, but I don't get it. I think he sucks, but he made C tier. And then last Ooh, in my job, C Reinar. tier, <laughs> last in my C tier is Phi. I don't know why you'd play Phi over Viscerai right now. I think Viscerai blocks better and does more damage and is pretty, Mostly just a better version of Phi, though I guess he's less vulnerable to Warmonger's Recital, the new card that they choose War Piece. Um, oh, that's one other card I didn't mention with Ice Lander. Warmonger's Recital might make her better. I haven't tested with it. I've been playing Lavia. So <laughs> go try Warmonger's Recital on Ice Lander. If it's great, then maybe she's B tier, even like the bottom of A tier. But I am dubious. 
Is that the right word? That's the right Same. word, right? Yeah, you did it. Sweet. Okay. And Phi just not really do there's not really a reason to play Phi. I think doesn't block as well as Viscerai or Bolton or Briar. Doesn't do as much damage as Viscerai or Bolton or Briar. Hey, at least you got a sweet chest that blocks for three, right? Could you imagine having a new chest that also blocks for three as, as yeah, your all, chest? All, all three of those heroes do. <laughs> yeah, the three other heroes do that too. <laughs> so, sorry, Fi. Oh, Better luck next oh time. Maybe they'll unban Belittle and you can be good again. Because Belittle Art of War, those were so much, so, such good turns. But those now were he's the got days. nothing. 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 That's it. You're done with you're done with your C tier. That's it. That's all of them. I got four okay. heroes left in D tier. Okay, I got three heroes left in D tier. So that means you have Dorinthian D tier, Arachne D tier, Rift Tide D tier, and I'm so proud of you, buddy. We did it. We both put Prism in D tier. So I put Prism. I actually have her as the worst hero. In the, I put her as the worst hero <laughs> in the game right now. <laughs> I put her dead last. Wow. Wow. So I don't think you can beat a decent chunk of the good heroes right now. I think your Droma matchup is pretty bad. I think your Viscerae matchup is pretty bad. I think your Lexi matchup's not great. I think your Azalea matchup's not great. I think your Uzuri <laughs> matchup's fine. You could probably beat Uzuri. Can't beat Levia either, probably, but you could beat Uzuri. So there you go. Sorry. Sorry, Prism. 32 health is not a lot. And then the the Angels and the new Numenaris, the new Luminaris, are both like fairly disappointing. They're just not very well. The, the new Luminaris is quite bad. Two resources to give something go quite again bad. as your only weapon. Like Voltaire, one one resource to give your thing go again, and you can do it twice per turn. Come on, and you get forty health. I don't know what to tell you, buddy. As you're preaching <laughs> the choir on this one. <laughs> it's, um, I was like, sure, I guess if we want all these millions of resources, let's play Vestures of Soul, because then we could turn our blues into uh, four cost things. And look at this. You need two and two and two and two and two and do it all. And to, it all works. Except even when you jump through the hoop and you have landed a herald attack and you've hit with it, and it's going to go into your soul to make your Vestures of Soul pitch for more. Once it's in your soul, you can't activate Numenaris to give that Herald go again with your newly turned on Vestige of Soul. So that means you have to pitch your blue before the Herald's in your soul for three, but you want to be pitching it for four because you want to play the two and then play another two to attack with like another Herald, attack or transform with an Angel, or do anything else in her whole deck now that costs at least two resources to do to think about taking a game action. Uh, but you can't do that with that interaction. So it's very frustrating. Uh, I'm very sad that she's bad because I liked Old Prism quite a bit. You could tell, like, it's kind of like where I said the design space on Bolton. Like, if you're going to pull punches for Bolton's design space because you're afraid of Saper's combo, just ban Courage of Blade Hold. And if you're going to pull punches this much because of the dumb spectra or just ban them just ban like i would rather have like a playable interesting hero that does like new things than like or just like suspend them for as long as she's in the format or something like that but like i don't know like it's just so the whole play her whole play pattern just does not make a lick of sense to me at the moment just i don't i don't know it's there yeah so i think the best way to play prism right now if you are going to try to make her work I think it's something with Iris of Reality. I think the new Luminaris just isn't good enough. I think Iris is the way to go, and you're just playing prism, old Prism with a worse weapon, with a worse hero ability, with eight less life, but you can play a very similar game plan and might still be good enough to beat some heroes, but I I just... Um, I don't I don't think Prism's good enough. There is there is one thing that I saw that was interesting that you can like loop Arclight Sentinels with the uh with the Herald that puts rebirth, the yellow back the on top of your deck. The Angel of Rebirth, yeah. Or yeah. So if you you can loop Arclight Sentinels and essentially like lock someone out of the game. But the setup seems really high on it. It seems really hard to pull off. And there are a lot of ways to get out of that loop. Like if your opponents put two copies of Lead the Charge in their deck, eventually they're gonna draw a Lead the Charge and get out of the, the combo or scavskin leathers or make rune chance with viscerai or briar 
or play a blink if they're Lexi. Like there's a lot of ways that like if this deck ever does become a real threat, you can devote one or two sideboard cards to it. And like once you're doing that plan as Prism where you're looping Arclight Sentinel, you're never actually killing your opponent through damage. You're you're literally fatiguing them by attacking with his angel for four and putting Arclight on top of your deck over and over again, which means that you have plenty of time as the other player. No, you would actually an die. I, I don't think you have inevitability with that plan, actually, because I, I was just thinking about it as like you were talking about it. And I was like, well, how could you get out of this? I don't think we're in chance to work because they could just pitch to AB and then whatever. But like, think about the timing interaction of when you have to play the Arclight Sentinel. You can't play it on their turn because they will get to take a full game action before uh, you play the Arclight Sentinel. And that game action is just going to attack you or your stupid angel of rebirth and it goes away your combo is broken so that means on your turn you're going to need a genesis uh in order to enable this as well because you need the constant um cards and soul to attack with the angel in order to buy back the card so you need genesis this angel and arc lights that in your graveyard you need to like genesis a card get back your arc light sentinel oh but then the arc light sentinel is on top of your deck so then you're drawing it on your opponent's turn and they get to take a game action right you have to have two Arclight Sentinels. So you have to have one Arclight Sentinel on play and then put the other one on top of your deck. So they kill it and then you play another Arclight Sentinel and then you put the first one back on top of your deck. Okay. So you so, you you have some amount of cards. You have an Arclight Sentinel Genesis on the battlefield and one Arclight Sentinel. No, an Arclight Sentinel in your hand. You have Arclight you Sentinel have, in your graveyard that they blew up last time. It's your turn. You have a four card hand. And somehow mm-hmm. you have a Genesis and an Angel at play. Sure. <laughs> and then okay, you play so you use one card to Genesis, and um, that means you need at least two blues to play the Arclight Sentinel. And it's the moment you don't draw two blues, you don't get to attack with the Angel. Your combo is broken because you need two resources to attack with the Angel as well. Right. It. It. Well, if they're light blues, then you can Vestige, and Genesis will trigger your Vestige, so that sure. helps. But. I think the deck is probably all blues and yellows, maybe a couple of red defense reactions or something. But Sure, it's... but the moment you draw one of those red defense reactions, the combo's broken. And well, that's to say nothing else. So think about this too. So let's say your whole combo works too. So you, you have your whole combo going or whatever as well, and you're attacking okay. with this angel. So um, every turn, you just swing your weapon at the Arclight Sentinel. So you're taking no cards out of your deck, but every turn they're spewing one card out of their deck in order to uh, keep this Genesis loop going. And so as long as, and this angel's only attacking for four and presumably it's the only attack return. So they're attacking for four. So you just have to block for like three. So each angel attack, so you're both just going through one card out of your deck. So if they don't have enough cards to fuel this, They'll run out of cards to keep the loop going, and then they'll die. Right? It just seems like a very yeah. Uh, I, I don't I don't believe in this. Basically, is what I'm saying. I don't think it's a. I think it's a th- <laughs> fun thing to think about conceptually, but I think in practice it will fall apart and doesn't actually work. Yeah, we'll we'll see. I I put Prism in D tier for a reason. Um, okay. I could see some real deck, like some Prism deck that's playing a normal game with Iris and like a really high blue and yellow count and very few reds that also is like kind of threatening to do this. Um, I think you probably honestly need energy potions to get the Genesis down at the start. So that's already like a really, really weird version of Prism where you're energy. More no blocks. That's what Prism needs. More cards that don't block. (laughs) So, well, (laughs) I don't know. I, I don't think it's good. Prism is in D tier on my tier list. I think she is uh, not in a great spot. I think that they were quite harsh on building a prism, building or on this prism. She did not get a lot and lost eight health, which eight health is a lot of health. That's She has two more health than Kano. Yeah, but you think about it, Michael. Once you jump through all the hoops and make two angels, you're a break even, basically. Wait, what? Oh, because the angel's at four health. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. All right, moving on. I got Dorinthia next. Um, she has not done well since, like, I don't know, since I started playing. I've never seen Dorinthia do well. I think there was one that top aided one thing one time, and everyone was like, whoa, Dorinthia. But, Checks uh, out. She didn't get any new toys. Well, she did get new toys, I guess, but I don't think they're very good. The new gloves. 
are there, but I'm not sure if they're better than the other one. Cause the other one, you could like kind of like save your resources and your opponent wouldn't know if you were going to like route them or what. Um, this one, you just like spend a resource, you attack with it. If it hits, you get a courage token, but usually Dawnblade wasn't hitting. If Dawnblade was hitting a lot, you were usually winning. So I don't know. I, I think that um, you can also explore playing the big axe, Dorinthia or Bolton with the, the axe that attacks for four, but um, probably worse at fatiguing than Bravo. And yeah, less, people have been talking about like this fatigue warrior, and I feel like people who talk about fatigue warrior don't understand like you don't fatigue through blocking as guardian, you fatigue by attacking, and you have to be presenting attacks that are worth blocking in order to do that. And none of these axe warrior cards are worth blocking ever because they're just slightly above rate mopey damage. And so there's two different types of fatigue. There's fatigue through blocking and fatiguing through damage. And uh basically the guardians fatigue through attacking a lot of the time with these big disruptive attacks that you know you spend one card of out of your deck in order to present like nine damage plus and this really disruptive on hit your opponent has to spend two or three cards blocking it you did it you're up one card in deck overall their turns lower in power level because they don't have enough cards to block or use on offense anymore since they blocked you did it you're well on your way to being a fatigue guardian player uh when you are a warrior you don't have any of these efficient high value one card uses when combined like you can kind of get there you can like with the axe maybe you get to like eight i think you can get to like plus four off of one card uh from your deck so then you get like eighting the problem is that this of uh, this damage this 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 one card out of your deck for eight has no disruptive on hit and your opponent can just take the eight damage they're not incentivized to block you at all and then just swing back their 45 damage lexi turn or whatever because you didn't do anything real on the game state and then you're just left blocking with just like a bunch of blue three blocks in your deck and you're like oh i can't block this 45 damage with 12 block out of my hand and but i get four extra armor you know i get to I'll go up to 16 on those 45 damage turn we're fatiguing now buddy yeah uh it's probably not good enough but it does have <laughs> it does have that uh, ability that if they block it their block is minus one so Ooh. you know it it's that four damage they, they, they probably don't want to block it I hate that it's once per turn. I I thought about maybe building a Dory deck because I was like, well, if you can give this go again and then like use Dory's ability to swing it twice, that seems okay. Like I, I think maybe I can get behind that, maybe a game plan like that or something. Uh, but the second axe doesn't then re shrink a block. It just is just four vanilla damages because it's once per turn on the effect so i was just like i'm off it if i don't even get rewarded for attacking with this twice i don't even want to do it so you got me Fair. sorry dory maybe maybe next time maybe next set you'll be better but it's just all the, become all the light. warrior just transcend just, in here. just transcend to be a light warrior that we all want you to be dorinthia i will happily put you in a library and have a grand old time okay Next hero, I got Riptide. Uh, so he I think Riptide he's is there. like he's he's like actually good into a couple heroes. Like he's good into No Ice Lexi. He's good into uh, I'm sure there's he's good into the ninjas. He's good into the ninjas, and uh, you know that's that's three heroes. That's that's pretty good. And they also banned his gloves. He he lost his bullseye bracers. He played, I think every Riptide deck I saw played bullseye bracers, and he actually really needed that because it enabled some of his hands where he didn't have like the the go again thing or the trap to put an arrow into his arsenal. Because the best versions of Riptide have been pretty red heavy, so they don't really want to pay one to use a bow. And yeah, poor Riptide. He is really struggling. He has a lot of matchups that like he wasn't designed to be able to compete with, like. Riptide as a hero was not designed to be able to fight against Dromai. It's just he's just not capable of it. He was designed to play um Uprising, not Uprising, Outsiders Limited. And he was sweet for Outsiders Limited. Um I don't think he was made for Class Constructed. And they gave us an adult Riptide, but yep, he's not there. He's not there. Sorry, Riptide. 
even without ice, you mentioned a card in the Kano. Could you imagine if you're trying to play Riptide and your opponent just flips over Heart of Ice? Wait, wait. Can you if you're trying to play Riptide and your opponent flips over Heart of Ice? Yeah. Like Lexi flips over Heart of Ice against Riptide. I mean, you're like, oh, you don't want to pitch a lot. You know, you're know, you apparently a red line deck. <laughs> Seems pretty that's hard to play all these. Good when they yeah, all cost yeah. One. Playing all these defense. And that's not even to say like Frostlock exists. And like yep. that also, also reads you don't get to play the game because all of your cards are costing zero. So not only are all your things then taxed an additional one, they all, it also stops you from playing any of your traps that turn if it hits or doing anything on your turn as well. Like it's just... I don't think he's particularly good in the Lexi at all, but you know, what do I know? I just put him in D tier. All right. Uh, last year, bottom of my D tier, Arachne. Um, just play Uzri if you want to play Assassin. Arachne doesn't have a specialization, and their hero power is quite bad. Um, the fate ceiling is not a very powerful mechanic in this game. You can kind of put their blues on the bottom and leave their reds on top and try to banish their reds. But um, face ceiling is not particularly strong, and the contract cards are not strong enough to warrant face ceiling to try to like set them up. Like The fact that you'll get a extra silver sometimes is nice, but all the contract cards, except the three Majestics, leave no witnesses, surgical extraction, and eradicate. Eradicate's the yellow one, right? Mm-hmm. I think. Um, yeah, that's the one that banishes the only good damage ones. you deal. And... Eradicate's only good if you can get there on fatigue and surgical extraction is a blue at the normal rate for blues. So it's only good if you have a way to push it over. Leave no witnesses is a great card. That card's very good. Um, but you can just play Uzuri and play leave no witnesses. Checks out. Checks out. I don't And you get shakedown and a good hero power. Sorry. Yeah, Arachne. Maybe one day they'll print contract cards matters or better contract cards. Uh, maybe a piece of equipment that says your first card with contract gets go again, some shoes, some contract shoes. I don't know. So they need something. A functional weapon would go a long way for Arachne as well. D tier. Agreed. Glad we're on the same page. But yeah, I'm glad we're, we're, we're really not that far off, you know, in all our evaluations. I think it's just mo- mostly like a half tier difference between a lot of our heroes um it's not like you were like i think azalea is s tier and i'm like i think she's d tier like there's no discrepancies that wide it's just mostly like you know the hero levels all kind of fall into this relatively like flat power line except for the huge power spike that is like lexi i feel like but you know her power spike was like maybe this high and then they bold bands i they yeah they banned bullseye bracers and now she's like here you know <laughs> got her where everybody else is still like here you know this this little two to three percent margin lexi's definitely still gonna have her time in the metagame that's that's for sure yep yep she's still very good mm-hmm. especially if bravo sucks if bravo sucks it's just like she and she can just go like heavy 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 ice to just punish all these aggro decks that are like oh i'm gonna disrupt icelander by playing my shakedowns in my uh you mean ice, like, what was that card you just said yeah it, leave no uh, witnesses. it's just like leave no witnesses thank you and it's just like yeah well try doing that through three frostbites and a channel like frigid and you're just gonna go i actually just passed the turn back to you so that's not a very good game plan when that happens <sighs> We'll see. If if Lexi goes too ice heavy, then she could always get more fatigable again because ice cards aren't great at being at stopping you from getting fatigued, especially if you are on like rampart or things like that. I don't know if there's anything else like rampart that you can like spend your resources defensively. I guess cards like Oasis and big defense reactions like Steel Blade Shot and Soul Shield, maybe. You think you'll be able to fatigue Lexi through blocking? If she's playing fifteen ice cards. I don't. I still don't believe it, but I guess maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see. I guess. Okay. Any final thoughts about the meta? I didn't. I know you're playing Levy this weekend. Uh, any other heroes you're super excited for overall, though? Uh, I'm excited for Worlds. Got announced. Uh, yeah. <laughs> other heroes. Vincent. I think 
I hope she's good. I want her to be good. Put her in C tier because I don't see it right now, but she's a cool, cool hero. It's really cool design. It, like a defensive rune blade is something we hadn't seen before. And I think like she's definitely leaning defensive. So yeah. For sure. Agreed. I hope you have a wonderful time in Spain. It's still looking like I'm not going. I think it's like a week or two before my finals. I looked at the schedule, so it might be a little hard for me to swing Oof. going all the way to Spain. Uh, but flights are cheap. So, I mean, that that at least goes a long way. So maybe I can tell my professors that I have a very important family matter for that weekend. It's very much in the flesh and blood, and they'll understand. So <laughs> Have to be there in the flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. I have to be there in the flesh and blood. They'll be like, okay. We'll push back your finals one week. And I'll be like, thank you. Well, with that being said, the next time you're in Spain, always remember.